Hello and welcome to 11FS Spotlight. I'm Simon Taylor. Uh, in this weekly show, we shine a spotlight on the best and brightest in tech and the financial services industry to try and understand what gets them going, what gets them growing, and what they think the future of the industry is going to look like. Uh, on today's Spotlight, I am delighted to be joined uh, by Phil Doust, who is Vice President and Managing Director at the National Bank of Canada. How are you doing today, Phil? Pretty good, pretty good. Thank you for having me on. No, thank you for visiting us in our wonderful studio. How do you feel being here? Uh, it's great. It uh, also required for me to take a plane, which is brilliant at this time of, of life, right? Right, yeah. How did that feel? You sort of uh, made it in one piece? I did make it in one piece and then not sick yet. So yeah, it's uh, maybe going back to normal will be good. So on today's show, we're going to talk a little bit about you and we're also going to take a deep dive into National Bank of Canada. But let's start with FinTech North, like the Canadian FinTech space. Um, can you just uh, sort of contextualize uh, where you see uh, fintech in Canada, um, and maybe some for the folks that are not familiar with uh, financial services in Canada. You know, like what does the market look like? Uh, how's it structured? So, so maybe I'll start with with the market of Canada. So the, Canada is dominated by five big banks, There's five national big banks. So a very oligopolistic market, and then there's a, a, a few a big regional bank, two or three, and then you move to to small tiers banks. And um, in terms of fintechs, the market was very slow to start with. Um, Canada is usually a bit late uh, compared to the rest of the world just because it's usually starting the U UK, move to Europe, US, Canada. Um, and the other thing that really changed how we, we uh, the adoption of fintech was affected in Canada is in 2008, when there was the banking recession, we actually fared very well. Mm. Like the banking sector was very solid. We had no bank failing. We had no bank close to failing. So people feel very secured in their bank. And as the UK was swept by uh, some bank going belly under, same in the US, people felt that the bank were not as secure anymore. And they were comfortable moving to a fintech, mm -hmm. which was not the case in Canada. So we lagged into adoption on fintech for a long time. Five years ago, I think we were at 30, 35% adoption, while you guys were more at around 80, 90%. Mm -hmm. Now today, uh, five years later, we're at 80 something percent. So it has been picking up and that obviously shows as well. Um, where it also shows is in the maturity of FinTech five years ago, uh, I would say 90% of the FinTech were at seed series A, and now we have FinTechs maturing towards series B, C and, and looking into IPO. And that's really helping the entire ecosystem to, to get developed. Uh, and can you give me an example of like the things that we would see as common in a, in a fintech scene? So you've now got the emergence of neobanks and challenger banks. You've got open banking. You've got all of those pieces starting to merge EKYC providers. How would you rate the infrastructure picture in Canada if I was uh, an entrepreneur? So it's still a bit late on the UK. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, you've adopted open banking way before we did. Um, and and the banks have been slower adopters than than the UK, so that shows also on the fintech sector where a lot of fintechs works with bank rather than being fintechs that that try to challenge bank. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, it's it's evolving very fast. We're catching up on the world, and we're now having our fair share of fintech that are successful. We're also seeing in Canada less entrants from the outside world. Mm. So usually, you know, if you're a UK company and you're dreaming of North America, usually you're not dreaming about Canada, <laughs> you're dreaming about the US. So we see those, those companies go to the US. A on the other side, the US company uh, comes to the Canadian market very late because there's a language problem for them. Mm. They suddenly have to deal in two languages, French and English, and they're a bit scared of that, so they prefer to go to the UK, to Australia, before they actually comes to their neighbor to the north. Mm. So it's still a, a, a place where there's a lot of opportunity to work with, with, with the ecosystem and to make it a decent place in a 37 million people country. And, and yeah, that's a sizable market, but also it feels like uh, whenever fintech really takes off somewhere, you see these same things start to emerge. You see the beginnings of an open banking conversation. You see some neo banks start to arrive. You see um, some of the folks start to to do something. So how does it how does it feel being in the Canadian fintech scene at the moment? It, it's it's exciting uh, because y y not only do we have those companies emerging, but we also have insight because mm. we can just look at what other did wrong. <laughs> and not repeat it. So we've got those Canadian fintech have a higher rate of success than what we've seen in the past. 
because we can go and learn from the other markets, which is which is great for entrepreneurs. Um, one of my company's uh, portfolio uh, CEO always tell me, the only thing I have to do is put lipstick on a pig. Wow. And this is exactly what he does. He just copies whatever he sees elsewhere that is working because we're late. So there is a, a, a ton of opportunity on the fintech market scene still. As, as an example, um, the Australians are combining their uh, open banking and um, general data protection regulation rules into one, the, cons- the CDR, the Consumer Data Right yep. Act. And, and essentially, uh, access to my data and accessing that data in a way that I control are two sides of the same thing. And having seen what's happened in Europe around PSD2 and GDPR being almost completely separate things that became paperwork and uh, really difficult and quite narrow, that you can, as you say, watch that and do something better. And Canada has a real uh, op- opportunity to, to kind of do that. Um, maybe it's worth talking a little bit about um, National Bank of Canada. So yep. tell, me, tell me its story as well. So National Bank started a bit more than 150 years ago. Uh, we're the sixth largest bank in the country. Mm-hmm. Uh, we do uh, uh, the entirety of, of what a bank does in Canada. We're also the second lar- largest bank in Cambodia, which is usually little known. Mm. Um, we've got a big branch in the US, not a retail banking branch. It's uh, The company is called Credigy. And what they do is they buy back uh, fintech loans. Mm-hmm. So our history of working with fintechs is just ingrained in what we do at National Bank. And, you know, when the ecosystem started uh, seven, 10 years ago, remember the story from the fintechs where it was, we're going to destroy big banks. Um, That didn't happen yet, at the very least. Um, And I think that when the the, the, the fintech world started changing their approach to say, no, we're going to work with big banks, because what we built over 150 years in terms of deposit cannot be replicated easily. Mm -hmm. Um, As soon as they had that switch, National Bank was there to work with them. Um, so we've been working with fintechs for a long time now. I'd say it's a good mix. And can you give me an example of some of the fintechs that you've been working with historically? And then maybe tell me about um, the ventures team as well. Yeah. So in terms of fintech that we've been working with, obviously, uh, Flinks is a great example of how we offered our clients data aggregation and, and, and uh, we're working with them in open banking. And we ended up buying back Flinks. So we can talk about that later. Um, we're working right now with Nesto to review how we're, we're doing our mortgage experience, et cetera. So the fintechs have already been ingrained. We work together today. We work with about over 50 fintechs and we've invested in about 20 of them. Wow. So in terms of, of any ventures, the group was set up four years ago by the CEO himself. Um, he was seeing us work with the fintechs and what he wanted to do is ensure the uh, uh, financial future of those fintechs. Because obviously in a big bank, what costs a lot is integration to your system. Yes. So he said, I, I want to pick the winner. I just don't want to pick a fintech and then it dies. So that's how the group started, investing in companies to make sure. And the way we built it is the bank works really closely with the fintech we invest in and we help them grow to, to other market. Uh, we never take exclusivity. We want them to work as with many banks as possible. Um, and really pick the winner so that we don't have to integrate again Mm -hmm. and build an ecosystem in Canada that is much stronger than what it was before. And I think that uh, we've been able to manage that quite a lot. It's the definition of strategic investment is that I want to have a new supplier, but I really want to partner with them. So I'm going to make sure they're alive long enough to get through my processes to be able to work with them. (laughs) Totally. And and listen, the, the other thing with fintech for us, it was a no brainer. As we're the sixth bank in the country, my IT budget is around 400 million. RBC, uh, which is the biggest bank, is 2 billion. Mm-hmm. So how do I compete with that? It's impossible. So I'm using FinTech to, to bridge all those gaps, concentrate on what I'm good, and let them do what they're good as well. It's probably worth experience. contextualizing the provinces and your geographic spread as well and, and where National Bank sort of fits within that. So uh, in terms of retail banking, we're uh, very concentrated in the eastern part of Canada. So Quebec and and the, uh, and up to Toronto, if, if you know a bit the Canadian geography. Mm-hmm. In terms of wealth, et cetera, then we, we cover the entire country. Um, so today about 50% of our revenue is from outside of Quebec and 50% in Quebec. Mm-hmm. 
Um, do do keep in mind that outside of Quebec include the U.S. and and Cambodia. Mm-hmm. It's, it's a good mix, and I think it puts you in a different position as like that sort of one below the quote unquote big five, but in a real opportunity to go attack the market and use fintech as a as a way to do that. A- a- agreed, and and when we partner with those fintechs, um, it's it's even easier because we're attacking the same market as them, where we're we're facing the same ch- same challenge that they're facing. So the alliance just become natural in between the two parties. I'm curious that you mentioned um, Flinks earlier. Uh, can you tell me, uh, just unpack who those guys are and, and what was the thesis behind the investment? Yeah, so so Flinks is a data company. Um, they're the, uh, they started by doing aggregation like Plaid is doing. Uh, and if you want to think about Flinks, it's, it's basically Plaid for Canada. Um, so they started like this. We started working with them very early. We were uh, part of their first round of investment. Um, and and basically, uh, the the working together between Flinks and National Bank came very naturally in terms of vision of where we we should be going as as the Canadian market, in terms of people as well. Uh, strangely, often people say, "Oh, a culture in a fintech, culture in a bank, they're, they're going to clash." Uh-huh. Actually, the clash never happened. Um, we we've got an entrepreneurial mindset for a big bank, and uh, it, we were working very well with them. So uh, when it came to time to talk about open banking and we were seeing open banking evolved in Canada, moving towards a, a, a law probably in 23, 24, uh, we thought that not going at it alone, but going at it with partners and being the bank of the fintech environment in Canada would actually be the best way to do open banking. So we were already an, a, a proponent of open banking, contrary to some of our competitors, where which were not... Uh, trailed about it. We've always been trailed about open banking and we want to see it go as fast as possible so that we can service the clients better. I'm interested in how you see uh, the market start to play out in Canada in the next sort of three to five years. Because as a ventures team, you, you're always looking forward. Yeah. You're looking to 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 what's what's going to happen and, and how it differs from some of the markets. Because uh, you know, in the US, we have uh, everybody's providing banking as a service. Everybody's playing in that space, but there are so many more banks uh, in Europe. We've seen you know the beginnings of payments processes and um, banking as a service providers really sort of make building a a fintech better, faster, cheaper, but you mentioned you've sort of uh, taken that approach to watch what others have done and learn lessons. Yep. What are the what are the things that you think the next few years start to look out as you think uh, about that fintech ecosystem and non-banks as well? Yeah, so uh, what we're going to see is obviously open banking is going to hit us. Um, and I think that adoption increasing in Canada is also something that is also a new environment for banks. When we were at 30% adoption, you could just ignore fintech if you wanted to. Now at 80, 85 and keeping growing, you can't ignore fintech anymore. So in the short term, I think that that open banking and the competition that fintech is going to bring into the experience and to make that experience better for a Canadian customer is going to be the up to two, three years uh, biggest uh, uh, clash. Now, in terms of, of, of uh, breadth of services, you're talking about banking as a service. I could add buy now, pay later, et cetera. They're basically nascent into Canada right mm-hmm. now. Uh, so I see banking as a service coming in a bit more into, in, into full force in two or three years. Uh, buy now, pay later probably in two or three years as well. And those are going to start bringing new uh, product and way of working for, for a Canadian uh, client. And there's a really interesting window of opportunity in in the Canadian market for who gets to win there, I suppose, because you've got uh, the the big global providers, the US providers that might start to eventually think to move north. Um, But then you've got sort of, can you do something homegrown? And, you know, Flinks is an example of a homegrown um, sort of startup that's doing really well. And, And what we've seen from the American when they start trying to come to Canada is they usually come and retreat and then come back often retreat again and then come back a third time and then they're, they're for good. Because what they realize, they always come to Canada thinking it's going to be the same and it's going to be uh, the US bis. And Canada culture is actually very different. And then they, they hit their head the first time. Mm-hmm. Um, and by the time they come the third time, we usually have a strong Canadian contender that they need to push aside to be able to take that market. Mm-hmm. So in some case, like in the case of Flinks, Flinks have been resisting uh, very well to Plaid and Flinks is now attacking the US rather than Plaid attacking Canada full mm. force. So even if, if we're small, we, we're usually able to punch above our weight and defend our ecosystem. 
And I think it's probably worth talking about some of those differences as it gets into the the infrastructure layers, because uh, it, I, I have found genuinely that it, as soon as I started mentioning wire and ACH instead of faster payments, um, then the audience for fintech brain food almost doubled into the states because it's like, oh, that's the thing I've heard of. Uh, and But that works the other way around too. When coming into Canada, you need to naturally translate into all of the local payment systems and all of the local conventions and, and not a lot of providers kind of default into that aspect. Definitely. Um, it, it, the Canadian ecosystem market when talking about payment is very special because the bank got together created one payment ecosystem, one payment rail, which is Interact. And if you don't know how that work and you've never lived it in the US and you come to Canada and you start having to deal with the Canadian ecosystem mm -hmm. without having any, any entry, you're going to find it very difficult. And, and I think this is uh, the case is, as somebody from 11FS who's looked at lots of different markets, every time you enter a new market, it's a humbling experience because it's like, okay, there are, this rhymes with things I've heard before, but all of the labels are different. Yep. Uh, and, and that's kind of a, a humbling experience every time. And, and then, you know, you, you also have, like, if you move to the US, you've got 50, to, 50 state to care about. Canada, you've got 10 provinces to care about. Yeah. All the laws are different. So just a, a, assuming a position on all those laws is very taxing for, for fintechs. And of course, we've talked um, before on, on a lot of the 11FS content about how important uh, compliance is and regulatory is to fintech, and it's, it can be a real superpower in productizing compliance. How do you think about uh, the role of fintech in compliance? Can it make a meaningful difference in the Canadian market, or is it is it sort of that the regulators just won't move and nothing can be done there? No, the, the, the regulator is definitely willing to move in Canada. You need to educate them because there's things they haven't seen yet often, um, and same for the bank. Mm -hmm. But there's definitely a place to move there. Now, what we've seen with compliance, so reg tech and compliance tech trying to come to Canada, is they hit their, themselves with uh, the size of the market. Because again, compliance is different in those 10 provinces, so yeah. you'll have to, to, to adapt to 10 provinces. And, and not a lot of bank, there's not a lot of customer for there because of what I explained at the beginning. Mm -hmm. uh, five to eight top, financial institution, then you've covered 95% of the market. Mm. So the, the dynamics are so incredibly different. Um, I want to just take a, a slight change of gear. Um, you, National Bank of Canada was the first major Canadian bank, I believe, to reduce its direct brokerage fee to $0. Uh, what was the decision there? And is that um, sort of an area that you see a growth? In? Well, listen, for us, it's really uh, accepting where the market is going. Mm. Um, fees are going to go down. And you can either try to fight it or just accept that this is where it's going, move with the market, provide the best experience, and uh, find other ways to monetize the, the, the service you're offering to your clients. And this is really where we were going with this. We really think that we were looking around the world, zero fee brokerage exists everywhere. It should exist in Canada as well. Yeah, and, and there's an interesting sort of strategic choice there, which is get there first. Yeah. Uh, which is it's kind of um, does, it's, is that a philosophy you're taking across the organization as well, where you see something interesting globally and in the Canadian market, instead of trying to resist it, you're trying to get there first. We are, yeah. and, and it's it's we'll select where we go on this, but when we decide to go somewhere, we'll go full fledged mm -hmm. and, and we'll really move at the entire nine miles to make this happen. And and this is basically what happened to, to, to the brokerage. We just went, well, you know what? Let's try it. What do we have to lose? A happy client? I, I don't think they're going to move because of that. So, and we've had, we, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a full success. The number of clients we've onboarded uh, with that zero brokerage fees is is astonishing for us. Mm -hmm. So, and with the brokerage fees, uh, you then have the opportunity to go more into the Robinhood model. Are there limits to what you can do as a bank? Do you uh, see things where um, you know, there's still a role for fintechs to kind of come play in and around the edges? And where does competition end and sort of the, the, the bank risk appetite uh, sort of buffer up? It depends. On, on brokerage, I think we, we, we can go uh, as, as far as they go, mm -hmm. as long as you know, we, we're willing to invest in a technological platform mm -hmm. to, to uh, have the same experience. Because it's not only about a question about zero brokerage, you need to have the experience uh, that the client is going to like behind, otherwise they'll be willing to pay a certain fees to have that experience. So I think we can go the entire way. Um, 
I think that the only place where I would say banks have to play differently than the market currently is is around blockchain and 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 loans on on decentralized finance. Because mm. I always heard hear those platforms saying, yeah, it's it's faster. It's faster because they don't do KYC, they don't do mm. AML. And there's no way as a bank I'm not going to do KYC and AML. Mm. Now I hope for them that the regulator don't 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 go after them, but they will come. Yeah, and they will regulate those platforms. They will have KYC and AML, and I don't think that starting from that point, if I can improve my experience, they're really going to be faster than me. Yeah, there's an interesting question there about the the role of a bank in a DeFi world, and uh, you know, sort of what what should you be doing, and would would anybody want to use it? And uh, there's there's kind of this whole uh, emerging financial infrastructure there that's natively global, natively twenty four seven. What does that do to competition if we do end up in a world that's natively global, natively 24-7? And and I guess with fintech generally, we're starting to see uh, the likes of Stripe, the likes of uh, Square, the likes of others starting to look at other markets, starting to, to really expand. Do you think that we will see almost the, the big tech of fintech start to emerge? And would, would that impact Canada at all? We will. Yeah. I, I think we will definitely. And, and you just name a few. So block... Uh, which is their name now, mm. um, it, it is one of them that has been you yeah, know, attacking. Is their name se- now? Yeah, yeah exactly. It's attacking several countries yeah. at the same time, and basically where where they're going is offering extra than financial services. They don't stop at financial services. They'll mm. help you deal with the entirety of the experience. And, and that's a really good theme to pick up on. Like that services beyond like the financial products has been a big theme for us at 11FS since, since we founded. Um, can you give me some examples of what you're inspired by, what you've seen maybe in other markets of, of people that are doing that sort of thing? So we've got Lightspeed based in Montreal. So they, they, they started as a payment company. Um, and then they started offering inventory management for, for the company, HR management, et cetera. And now they don't call themselves a payment company anymore. They call themselves a small and medium-sized business experience company. And there's something interesting about that fintech is a way to monetize and to profit from having something that solves a customer's problem. So the customer's problem is not just getting paid, it's also managing payroll. It's also dealing with HR. It's also managing inventory. And it's it's kind of, uh, there's another Canadian company, you might have heard of them, Shopee. Uh, Fi, maybe? Yeah, they, they, did, they did okay doing similar sorts of things. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, and one of the interesting things about Shopify is if you look at their annual report, 55% or more of their revenue is from financial services. So uh, how do you play in that world? Like, uh, it surely somebody else is going to go build the thing, not yeah. you guys. No, d- definitely. We want to partner. Mm. A- and this is the old gro- goal of any ventures, um, is to go and find the right partners for the bank to be building that ecosystem. We can try to fight it and, and say, oh, I'm going to offer them a, a better financial product. But that's doomed to fail because mm-hmm. even if you give me a slightly better product, but the other guy beside can manage my inventory and my HR, it's an easy choice because mm-hmm. it's saving me so much time. So we need to move to that extra banking. I think this is where the world is going. And if we don't go there, we'll just become a back office for other and we're just going to lose the, the top end market. Your choice is being commoditized more yeah. and more or actually doing a mixture, I suppose, of, of doing things that go beyond banking yourself, but also supporting others that do. Definitely. And and uh, and the way we see this is competition is not bad. Mm-hmm. Competition is good. So if I can power up competition, why not? I'm going to do it because it, it brings the market further on. It brings market to a point where those extra banking services just going to become the norm. Clients are going to know more and more about this and, then, and they're going to ask more and more. And, and I think that in the long run, we're well positioned to go and tap that market. What's uh, interesting about, as I look at the US market, it benefited from maybe a couple of things in banking as a service initially. Firstly, Durban debit, the Durban amendment meant there was more interchange for smaller banks, which meant that the smaller banks were really incentivized to go partner with really large organizations to get those uh, card interchange volumes and to get those transactions. Uh, But that sort of trade a snowball uh, because of that ecosystem. What it sounds to me like you're saying is there's an opportunity to sort of take that idea but translate it to something that works for the Canadian market where maybe the large banks aren't as incentivized but somebody else who's kind of challenging them um, and has access to the infrastructure could play that sort of role. 
Definitely. And, and, and uh, you know, the, we're talking about oligopoly for uh, the banks, but it's about like that in every sector in Canada, mm -hmm. telco, uh, retail, grocery. And, and they all have an opportunity to go and tap their clients to offer them a, a banking product as well. Mm. And I think we will see them move in that direction. It's just a question of timing. Well, and that was going to be my next question, really, is what are your hopes for the next three to five years for the Canadian market? What, Like the movie version, how does this play out? Yeah, I think uh, s some people at the bank wouldn't be happy with my answer, but I, I hope for more disruption. Mm -hmm. The more disrupted we get, uh, the faster we'll move into providing even better client experience. And mm -hmm. I think this is really the key to winning. The the better your experience is to the client, the more they're going to want to bank with you or with your partners and, and make a headway in the market. Yeah, I think that focus on customer outcome, that focus on experience, it sounds like such a cliche, but it's it, it's weird. It might actually work. But the thing is, is that financial, I don't know in the rest of the world, but at least in Canada, financial services has not have not been taught with the client in mind. They've been taught with the banks in mind. And we need to change that paradigm and s go and meet the client's need. Uh, what a crazy, crazy idea. I know. Uh, it's, uh, as we're coming towards the end of the show, I want to uh, finish by asking you one last question. You can answer this however you like, but uh, if it's related to fintech or not. But what advice would you give to your younger self? Yeah, that's, that, that's always a good question. Um, so I'll give it completely outside of fintech. Um, if I had to, to give myself an advice when I was younger is the person that's going to defeat you the most in life is actually going to be yourself. So don't negotiate it. Your, don't negotiate yourself down on anything. Mm -hmm. Just go for everything you believe in. You're going to have some losses, but at the very least, you're not going to have, uh, decrease your success in yeah. the meantime. Go for it. Go I think for, that's yeah. it. It's when when those of us that struggle with confidence, then I think there's plenty of us that need to hear that. So I think it's a great message. Uh, alrighty, everybody, that comes us to the end of the show. Uh, thanks, Phil, for joining me. Where can people find out more about you and everything you're getting up to at NA Ventures? So they can go on the yeah, NA Venture site, uh, which is also the National Bank. Check it out. Check out NA Ventures. All right. Uh, that's all we have time for this week, unfortunately. We could keep going in the Canadian market forever, I think. But uh, make sure you follow 11FS on LinkedIn, Twitter, and even Instagram. Heck, follow us around if you see us in the street uh, to stay updated with all of the cool stuff we're doing. And if you enjoy our show, subscribe to the YouTube. Like, check us out um, where you can find out uh, a lot more about us and catch up on previous episodes. Have a good week, everyone.